Good evening, everyone. I'm calling to order the Tuesday, November 12th, 2024, Southeastern Regional School Committee meeting. Um, and let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Let's have a moment of silence, please. You may be seated. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Guests can follow votes using the link on Southeastern School Committee website or watch live on our Facebook page. We're also recording this meeting. Um, and first up on the agenda is the report from the student representative and Adriana. Thank you. Um, so as the school year is flying by, it's amazing how much has already happened within two months. Um, term one has officially ended and especially the seniors are busy with college application and industry credentials. Um, there's a mix of excitement and nerves uh, as everybody thinks about the future, whether it's college, whether it's going into the, into the field, whatever you need, you want to be in it. Um, November kicks off with a family fun day on uh, November 2nd, organized by the Skills USA. Uh, the event brought the community together and featured a car show, music, crafts, food trucks, and raffles. Um, it was a great day for families to enjoy the time together, and the turnout showed just how strong and supportive the community is. Um, people of all ages had a blast, and the event was a wonderful way to celebrate fall while there's a school spirit, um, including a good friend of mine, Ivan, being pied in the face. Um, <laughs> Fall sports have also been a huge part of the excitement. Both the boys and girls soccer team had a fantastic season, both making it to, I believe it was states, states or uh, regionals. Um, language skill and teamwork that made everybody proud. School spirit has been incredible with lots of fans cheering everybody on. Um, the buzz around the powder puff football game uh, between the senior and junior girls and the interesting cheer routine um, to come is huge. It's a fun, but it's an intense tradition and everyone is practicing hard to make the pep rally an unforgettable event. Um, it'll also bring a chance to bring the whole school together and celebrate all of Fall's achievements. Um, also highlighting the, um, the assembly we had, I believe it was last week, um, acknowledging those who got honors, high honor roll, and um, yeah. Um, November is Men's Mental Health Awareness Month. Um, and our school supporting it quite uniquely. Uh, students and staff are being encouraged to grow their facial hair or beards uh, to raise awareness about men's mental health uh, and well-being. It's important to start conversations and supporting one, one another and breaking down stigmas around mental health. Um, another special addition to this month is that every Wednesday will now be Hawk Pride Day. Uh, so wear white and blue or any Hawk gear that anybody may own. Um, and last but certainly not least, I am really excited to highlight a new student-led podcast um, created by Zachary Wright, Jerry Donaldson, and Julius D. Oliveira. Uh, the podcast is called Voices of the Future. Um, it's all about connecting students and teachers through the real conversations. Um, they share their life experiences and talk about how their values and decisions have shaped who they are while teachers and staff or any guest that is invited onto the podcast um, speak about where, where they are today and what led them to where they are today. Um, the Secretary of Education was also invited to be a special guest on the episode at the request of the three boys. Um, it's a space for learning, asking questions, and getting insights, helping everyone grow and better understand each other. Uh, students and staff are encouraged to reach out to any of the boys, Zachary, Jirai, or Julius, for more information. Um, it's really just a safe space for anybody to talk about whatever's on their mind, whatever's current, whatever they feel that they can't really speak to maybe their parents or maybe 
maybe they just want insight on a certain situation. Um, the boys created this pod- podcast, and I believe they're on episode three-ish. Um, they're finishing up the previous episodes, <clears throat> which will be sent out soon, I believe. Um, but I'm really proud to say that my friends have created a safe space for people to talk about their feelings, to talk about what they feel as if not everybody would be comfortable talking about. Um, and they're inviting anybody and, and everybody to either sit in or be on it and give their insight. Um, but all in all, looking back at the year so far, uh, we've accomplished a lot. A lot has happened. Um, and there are so many more achievements and accomplishments to come. Um, but excited to keep this year going and see how, see how it all that works out. Thank you so much for your report. Um, I had the opportunity to listen to that first podcast with Secretary Tutwiler, and it was just fantastic. So I encourage anybody who hasn't had a chance to listen to the podcast to just uh, tune in. I I think it's just a really great initiative that they started. All right, next up um, is audiences and communications. All right, so um, this evening I would like to um, welcome a special guest, Jessica Aldred from West Bridgewater. Um, So we are still awaiting official results from the election, but um, at this point uh, Jessica does appear to have quite the the lead, so um, um, we hope to welcome her officially as a school committee member in December. So thank you for being here as our special guest this evening. Any other announcements? Next up is the plumbing field trip to Nashua. All right. So earlier in the year, we asked um, the school committee to approve all non-overnight field trips within the six New England states, but we did say as part of that that we would still keep you informed any time a field trip was going out of state. So this is to let you know that the... um, the plumbing shop is going to Nashua, New Hampshire on December 2nd. It's not an overnight, so that is just for your information. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, next up is um, announcements and public announcements. Mm. And conferences, conventions, and meetings. Mm-hmm. So you can see all of those coming up. It's going to become, it's going to be quite a busy year, a uh, uh, couple of months. Um, Just a note, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later on, um, that the holiday dinner for school committee is December the 10th at 5 o'clock, and that will be followed by regular school committee meeting. Okay, and then moving on to FYI news articles. Yep, and there's some news articles there for you to review at your... Okay, and um, we are now at five consent agenda, and I would actually like to pull out 5J, which is the donation of Nissan cars for Southeastern Regional. And the reason why I'm doing that is um, there is a donation acceptance as part of that. However, there is a transportation cost, so I I did want to to, um, highlight that before we go in and do the rest. And, and just to clarify, the, um, the department did budget for, and we have included in our budget, over $20,000 for them to purchase new vehicles for this year. Um, however, they were able to get these two donated vehicles, and we just need to pay the transportation costs. So those costs will come out of that budgeted line item for new vehicles. Okay. You've got to vote on that one separately. Yes. That? Okay. yes. Mm-hmm. okay, so I'm going to move to approve the... Um, Actually, I'll do. Uh, I'll move with uh, unanimous consent to p- approve the consent agenda. If those are no objections, it is approved. Madam Chair. Yep, so moved. And we have a lot of people to thank here because we are approving tons of donations. So I did want to acknowledge all the people who have um, given us donations. Um, so one of them um, was a variety of hair color from Paul Joseph's Image Salon of North Easton. We accepted the donation of a large propane tank from Caravan Lane of Needham. We received a donation of $2,005 Dunkin' Donuts gift cards from Erica Yurick. 
Um, we received donations of clothing articles um, for the career closet. And then we also received a donation of five computer keyboards from Cheryl Fernandes of East Bridgewater for engineering. We received the donation of these Nissan cars that we're transporting back. So a lot of great donations. Thank you everyone for your generosity with those. Okay. Yes, definitely. All right, moving on to item number six, which is our financial report and our treasurer's cash report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so this, this is, is the, the uh, cash report and reconciliations. Oh, so it was, yeah. yeah. I didn't hear the put it back. Sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, this is the uh, cash report with reconciliations through September 30th. Uh, you see on the first page is the summary of financial position in the draft form. And the next page is the documentation of that with receipts of a million eight. Uh, payroll and other expenditures of 3.4 million with a total cash balance at the end of the month of 13.7 million dollars. Uh, the next page is the budget's actual revenue. Uh, the <coughs> assessments from the cities and towns were not due in October, so there's nothing reflected there. They'll come in December 1st on schedule and. Um, <coughs> much else to say about that. The summary and uh, gross pay summary report is next. The total payrolls through October 19th is actually $7.1 million, with the breakdown of salary and hourly employees. The cash reconciliation page is in pretty good shape. It's actually... Um, just really outstanding checks for the three different operating accounts and a couple of other month end adjustments for the mass teachers retirement and a couple of other things, but nothing outstanding there. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Karen, just one quick question. Madam Chair, may I? Sure. Just one quick question. Could someone go up to the research or the variance, whatever that thing is? Oh, the variance uh, being Yeah, what's, what's that all about? Well, that's what it comes down to when all of my outstanding items here yep. don't quite add up to the variance between my bank balances and the general ledger balances. So that number fluctuates from month to month, yep. and it's something that's being researched through the GL. It'll probably clear itself out within the month. Gotcha. It kind of floats every month just to so everything summarizes back to that 598. Uh, back to the 598, I should say. So like the 154 for the payroll account down there, the ACH is in transit. That was the mass teacher's payment, probably of about 110, 115,000. Yeah, yeah. A couple of other things that get paid right on the first of the following month. I appreciate you, thank you. Yeah, for lack of better, it's just a, more of a timing issue. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was bank, wondering that. That's between the bank and the financial system. Yeah. So if you have more at the yeah, end of a month into August 1st, from July 31st or vice versa, You'll see those things clear up in the following months. So Mark, I appreciate you all. Thank you. Awesome. Any further questions for Karen? If not, I'll entertain a motion. I move to accept the treasurer's report. Yes. Do you just second? Second. <laughs> <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, we'll bring it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Uh, next up is the Assistant Superintendent of Finance and Administration's report. Well, good evening. So uh, you'll find our appropriated budget. So here we are, about, it's the fourth month of the school year now. Um, if you look at the very end, you'll see we're at 68% of our budget still available. So we're, we're in good shape running as expected. Mm -hmm. uh, again, you'll see some things, you know, we're starting to see a few items where some offsets will be needed, but those will be coming up usually usually December, January, those will come out for you to, to approve. I'll have those for you. Uh, but yeah, but at this point we're running uh, as expected. Uh, you know, we've had some things come up as the cars, you know, we'll save a few dollars there. Uh, we'll be able to offset that to other items needed. Uh, you know, we've had some other costs come up that were unanticipated with the STEM project. So, again, all those things offset each other pretty much. But yeah, at this point, we're running uh, as expected. So, I don't know if there are any questions there. I can answer or facilitate. 
Any questions for Mark? Mm -hmm. And then we also have our revolving funds. So again, these carry from one year to the next. Uh, again, I know you may be alarmed. There's a negative 372 down towards the bottom there in the TI, but that's just one program. So these run in a group. It was the tuition to the TI. So you take all the TI accounts, they're over $2 million in the black. But that's just to break out each program individually. So we can see how they're running year to year from uh, month to month. So we break those out individually. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a huge number, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> it's a scary number, but yeah. we, we get it. No, no, but you take all the TI accounts, yeah, no, you, you, you add those all up, you get the positive. Right. We've done this to help Pat when she looks at her programs to see where we're at. Yep. So is that is that just one program or is that so that's the center account so you see so what happens is a lot of the revenue gets broken up into the different programs okay. themselves mm -hmm. and then a lot of the costs get charged to the center account okay. so you see the costs there but the revenue in different account lines so if you were to take an example up above 803 the ti practical nursing okay there's 803,000 there yeah, yeah. Sure, sure, sure. so the revenue comes into each program individually yeah. but then we put all the expenses in that one ti institute center okay. account yeah. Gotcha. Any more questions for Mark? All right, well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, moving on um, to the ratification of payroll warrants. We could do, let's see, two at one time. We have the October 10th, 2024 warrant and the October 24th, 2024 warrant. Can I just ask a question? Of course. Um, I don't know if this is like a logistical error, but on the, um, where did it just go? On the vouchers, it has Mindy's name still on it, and I don't know if that's an issue. So if you click on the vouchers, it says like Holly, Mindy. Robin, yeah. So Tony. so she is still on, she is still on so officially. Still, yeah. Okay. Until a new person is that's born. That's what I thought, right. but I just wanted to yep. make sure that we didn't. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Yeah. All right. Madam Chair, yes. I move to approve ratification with respect to the financial report C and D as one. Okay. Can I guess second. 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 All right, any further discussion? If not, let's bring it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions, recusals. One recusal. So uh, motion passes, seven ayes, and one recusal. <coughs> Thank you. All right, next up is old business, which is not old, but continuing, which is our <laughs> STEM building update. <laughs> and we have um, Chair Heath. Uh, things are moving along. Uh, I'm trying to make up some ground on some time that we lost out there. Uh, the steel panels should be going up next week, I believe, that it's scheduled to come in. Um, there's been a few issues. There was a small piece of the roof that got missed on the uh, architecture. Um, so they're redoing that and coming up with costs mm -hmm. on that. And I don't think the roof is in yet. But I don't think we, so it's kind of stalled that a little bit. But the, the slab is pulled, steel is up, welds are done, uh, all signed off. Uh, curtain wall is going up. Uh, that's going to be all set. So we are trying to catch up. It's just been a few challenges. Mm -hmm. When's the expected completion date if we they can't catch up? We are hoping for February at this point, I think it goes out to. Mm -hmm. um, for the contractors and all of them will be offsite at that point, and then it's our baby. Okay. Um, so that's when the fun will really start. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Holly and I have spoken. We probably have to do a internal building committee meeting about the equipment and stuff and start that conversation. Like to do all the coordination. Again. Yeah. Um, without all the architects and you know <laughs> all them here, we don't need them you know, for that. Right. Right. So we'll try to schedule that sometime probably in January, I would imagine. Oh, before then. Before then? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> now, we don't have much time before. No, we, we don't. Have to and buy, so uh, <laughs> put that one on your docket, Christine. <laughs> <laughs> These meetings. <laughs> Is that an in person? Uh, this week is in person. person. This yeah. week is in person. Okay. Great. Any questions for um, for Andy? Yes. Uh, I'm sorry. You said about the roof. Uh, the roof. There's a. If you look at the building out there, where I always call it diesel. It'll always be diesel. To make yourself forget. <laughs> <laughs> it goes straight down. Then it jogs oh, yeah. in and comes out. Well, the architects missed the jog in. So when they put the steel frame up, there was now no roof over that. It's like a side roof. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah
So for proposed goals for this year, I know that you had set some goals um, to be able to guide uh, your team along for this year. Um, some of these things are complementary to your goals. Um, some of these might be an addition. Um, our first one was to increase co-op placement by 2% overall and then um, present co-op placement data which is um, what we're hoping to do quarterly for that and also um, for behavior as well. So provide quarterly reports on school discipline. Um, and then for MCAS, we want to have an MCAS goal, maintain the MCAS growth percentages um, in the same areas that we had identified in the previous year. Number four, which is what I had alluded to previously, improve language access for students and families for highly attended engagement events. Some of the ones that we identified were open house, freshman caregiver orientation, um, and expectation night. We said that at minimum, we're hoping that it's much more than that, but at minimum, we're hoping to, to see that improved language access. And then um, number five, um, what I'd like to see is maybe some proposed goals around communication. And when we talk about communication, I kind of have seen themes across different subsets of our population. So I see communication amongst with the school committee. I see communication within the district. I see communication. Um, also with um, our families and it's tough because we're very siloed mm. but I want to try to figure out a way and, and I want to challenge you to figure out a goal that might help us do a better job of communicating because I think that that's something that we'd all like to see improved and that is also an area where we can continuously improve as well. Absolutely. Um, and then our areas development, uh, like last year, communication, um, specifically with school committee. Um, school committee members are looking for more consistent communication. Um, and then um, another one had to do with delegating tasks. Um, and we'd love for to see you do more of that. <laughs> Which I know is I'm tough. On it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <laughs> right, right. Did you hear that, team? <laughs> so um, those were the two major areas for development that um, we'd like to see um, you work on for this year. But it's it's been such a pleasure collaborating with you. I mean, there there have been challenges this year, but you know, I, I think you have a really great team of people around you. Um, you know, obviously under your leadership, we've come to do some phenomenal things, but I also know that it takes a team to be able to do that, and you just have a lot of wonderful staff around you helping you and um, really providing their expertise, so I'm very thankful for that as well. Thank you. So I want to thank you for a great thank year. Thank you, and thank you for this is a very thorough and, and thoughtful and clear um, evaluation. I appreciate the time you took on this. I appreciate... Um, the collaborative uh, um, relationship that we have between myself and the school committee. I appreciate all the hard work that you do um, to support me and to support our, um, our administrators, our faculty, and our staff, and that's very clear. And I think, as you said, communication is something that we can almost always do better. Um, so I certainly welcome that that um, that that goal that challenge for this year. And um, I do have a great team, and um, I'm very very lucky. Some of them are here today: Jared and Christina and Rob and Mark and um, Pat and 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 um, Karen. And so I'm very very pleased and lucky to have a team of subject matter experts, but also people who are just really good people who are here doing the right thing. So we're excited for the year to come and excited to work towards towards uh, ensuring that every student, every staff member, every person, member of our community um, can be the very best that they can be and that they know that they are seen, that they are valued, that they are respected, and that we will not give up until the work is done. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. So next up on the agenda um, is the principal search. I asked um, Superintendent McClannan if she could just give us an overview of what's yet to come with um, searching for a new principal for the high school. So, um, as you know, last spring we conducted a principal search. Um, and at the end of that search, um, I did not feel confident that we had identified um, a strong candidate. Um, for this school year and so at that time it was my pleasure to appoint um, Christina Guarini as the acting principal for this school year. 
Um, at that time, we did let folks know that we would begin a um, search for the permanent principal um, in, in this fall or late fall, early winter. So I just wanted to update you on, on where we are. Um, in the next, um, before the end of this week, we're going to be sending out a pre-search survey to our faculty and staff. We want to ask them in particular, what are the characteristics that they are really looking for that are most important to them in a principal? Um, they're also going to have the opportunity to propose interview questions or tell us anything else that they would like us to know or consider throughout the hiring process. Um, the first round of interviews, we're going to have high school and district administrators, um, as well as the president of the federation or, or a designee of his choosing to be involved in, um, in, in first round interviews with everyone who has been pre-qualified. So um, through our HR department, we're going to screen applicants, make sure they meet the minimum qualifications. Anyone who meets the minimum qualifications should have an opportunity to interview. Um, and at the end of that first round, we'll be asking them to forward three to six um, candidates for second round interviews. At that point, the vice principals will be involved in interviewing. I think this is really important. Um, the vice principals are the people who work most closely with the principal. And so their ability to interview and ask some really in-depth questions about the day-to-day -day operations of, of the school will be very important. Would you be able to identify who the vice principals are for oh, those I'm who sorry. might not vice know who they are? Vice principal of Student Support Services, Dr. Shanna Howell, and vice principal of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, um, Katie Tuchinardi. Um, and then all administrators will have input into this process. Um, I just want to give them, because of the way that they work with the principal, sort of uh, an opportunity to, to have their own round of interviews. And then the third round will also be sort of like we did the last time. We will invite three candidates, um, three finalists, to meet with our staff and, and have some. Um, at that point, I'll do my one-on-one -on -one interview, but they'll have an opportunity to meet with students, with uh, faculty, with staff, with community stakeholders. I think it's very important that, that we're able to see how they actually interact with people in the community, how they interact with students. Um, and then um, I'm assuming that we will have external finalists. I believe we're going to have internal and external candidates for this position. Um, if there are external finalists, I, I may be able to schedule campus visits to, to see how they are um, received at their, at their schools as well. Um, so that gets a little tricky if people are not being quite as public about um, applying for other other positions for this position but we will see so our, our um, timeline is the job will be posted before Thanksgiving um, we're going to advertise it obviously on school spring and Mava but I'm also working I'll work with Rob on where we can post it um, externally to make sure that we are reaching the broadest possible applicant pool um, first round interviews we would expect to be done at the beginning of January um, second round middle to end of January. Ideally, we would have final rounds by February break um, so that we can make a decision. It's important for us to make decisions by that time period because if we're hiring somebody externally, they have a note, probably have to give notice to their school district and things like that. So if we hire somebody from within, they may have to, we may have to backfill that position. So um, I think it's important that we have that decision done by mid to, mid to late February at the latest. Mm -hmm. so. so I have a question for Rob. Now, I, I'm assuming that we're going to get a number of candidates and so kind of what sorts of things do you have in place to ensure consistency across interviewing so many folks? So there's a rubric that's designed in any of our search committee that we have is a matrix. Mm -hmm. um, the matrix will um, incorporate many different components uh, based off of what the job description is. And so that way we're, we're fairly um, assessing the individuals that are coming in. So it's not based off of feel, it's based off of credentials that are there. Because um, a lot of times um, individuals can look at a resume and easily put that to the side. Um, I am equity trained, um, so this is why it's coming through um, equity. Um, 
how is it called? It's not equity train, <coughs> losing the train of thought, but it is, um, we are uh, equity reps that are, right. so it looks over the applications to make sure everything is vetted through. Uh, myself, um, the HR department, we will sit down and kind of go through each, every one of them, mm -hmm. put them through the uh, matrix so that way everyone is, is scored fairly. Once all of those are, are there, then we can we can absolutely look at it as we forward the people for, um, the individuals for mm -hmm. it to be interviewed by the committees. Right, so I totally understand kind of the thought process behind having a matrix and, and making sure you're evaluating each candidate fairly in that way. How do you assess for fit? Or do you not assess for fit in that first round because you're using that matrix? So honestly, we because when you're looking at it and you're looking just at the the application, fit is tough without the actual interview. Um, so when when so as we're we're getting all the applications from either school spring or wherever we're, we're receiving it from, teachers lounge or any other area, um, fit is something that we're just looking at long as they have their credentials that are there. Mm -hmm. Fit really happens to be the personality that they bring into the room as they're being interviewed when um, amongst their colleagues and you know are looking at the individuals and kind of going back and forth with them. So it wouldn't be through myself looking at fit. Fit would be more of what's happening in real time as that individual is being interviewed. Okay, so then as it moves forward in the process, are there different matrices that people use for that? Like, how do you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So when they are, um, so let's say for instance, if a student, um, if a group of uh, administrators are meeting with that individual, they will have their set of questions and evaluations that they can base off of um, the person's questions, how they present, um, what they're stating in there, um, so they can kind of assess. Mm -hmm. And then that will then go to, and then same thing when they meet with students, when they meet with the principals, each group will have their own set mm -hmm. and they will be able to assess um, the interview process mm -hmm. and the interviewee's um, questions and answers. Okay. And then one last question, yeah. I promise I'll leave you alone. Yeah, no um, so, I mean, we're, we're gonna expect internal candidates, right? We wanna create a pipeline where people can um, be promoted from within and, and grow um, here at Southeastern. And what does, how do you, how do you balance that, I guess, is my question, right? Because we, we wanna have internal candidates, but we also wanna make sure that we're having the right fit of candidates coming through. Um, and and how, do you, how do you evaluate that part? Yeah, upward mobility is, is extremely important in your attention when we're looking at, um, when we're looking at our candidates. If they meet their requirements to be interviewed, we should interview our, yeah. our people. Um, once they are in there, the one thing I, I speak with our committees often is to evaluate the individuals based in the space. A lot of times it goes a little twofold because sometimes we bring bias into or in, right. into a into an interview based off of we might have had one experience or something of that nature. Um, so we try to really coach the individuals to not, you know, to that that's part of it's human nature. It's going to happen, um, but to make sure that they're following everything and they're fit and they're um, grading um, fairly and they're assessing fairly. Um, the other piece is is that we encourage our candidates to also know that when you're walking into an interview, not to assume that the people in the room know everything about you just because you've been somewhere for X amount of time. So really kind of being a little bit, you know, having an understanding that you're interviewing for position and you have to really, um, you know, sell yourself as if no one in this room knows the work that you've done. So, okay. so it, it's, it's, it's difficult, it's not easy because there is a lot of variables that come into it. Um, it's human nature to do things, you know, sometimes someone where uh, you know, a color or something like you know, that's just something like, oh, I don't like that person's shirt today or whatever <laughs> it may be, right? Um, we, we try to really coach people to not do that. So what I try to do for my positionality is to meet with groups prior to the interviews and to make sure that we understand when we're we're asking questions, we are very, we asking the same questions. If we're asking a follow-up, to make sure that that is gonna be fair and equitable uh, for the next candidate that we're not leading because those type of things. So be really um, 
to be very specific to what we're doing so that way we're not leading the group um, to unfairness or something that may be um, inequitable long term for that for that candidate. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. I do have a question. Yeah. Real quick. How many um, high school and district administrators are going to be interviewing this person in like a group session? I guess. So it all depends. We don't know how many people are going to be in, internally, mm -hmm. so that can vary. Um, right now, with the principals we have the two principals we do have um, a few others that um, superintendent McLennan we've been looking to see what grouping they would be in um, but everybody will have an opportunity if you are interviewing for it then you would be recused from that so are you having um, if you have multiple candidates you're going to have different groups of administrators kind of interviewing or it's going to be like one solid group of administrators and then it's just going to be like a handful, or is it going to be? I'm just worried about like intimidation factors when you're bringing candidates externally, at least for. Yeah, yeah and one of the th and that's a good point. Um, one of the things that, that I had talked about was, you know, we have the two vice principals, but then we have two directors: the director of guidance and the director of special ed. Do we have those four interview as a group so we don't have that kind of? But I think we just have to wait and, and see if within our administrative team are there people who are going to apply mm -hmm. because that will bring the number. Right, so yeah. outside of the vice principals, <coughs> we're not including those, but it, right. we still will have enough people to go in yes. and do it, and it still will not be like overwhelming. Yeah. Um, it depends on what you, like, usually when you have a, um, a group, you usually anywhere from five to six individuals that would be solid. Sometimes it can, um, for bigger searches um, that I've been a part of in years, it, it can be a little bit more than that. It all, it all, it all depends. Like again, we don't know who's applying. We don't want to, we don't want to um, assign it to any of anybody right now because right. if they do apply, we or they haven't or they're thinking about it, we don't want to deter them from applying. Right. So then that's what we're trying to figure Perfect. out. Could, could there be a potential to have too many cooks in the kitchen, um, like kind of in the bottom levels, um, like in the first first round before it kind of gets up? Too many people. Like you want to have good representation, but at the same time, it comes at a cost sometimes when you yeah. have too many, too so, much input. So what we're doing um, that's a little bit different from our normal search process here is we're going to have the HR department vet through the the, the initial applications, get them through the. Um, get them through the, the matrix, have our recommendations there, forward it to the group, so that way it's not one big group to forwarding it to another group, and way to be too many cooks in the kitchen, as you're, as you're yeah. mentioning. Um, from that standpoint, the group itself, that for that initial, will end up being, you know, so it already had been vetted through us. We would then send forward everything to that group, which will be about, again, on number six, Okay. Six, six, okay. six to eight individuals in that space, so that would be there. And that's pretty solid. Yeah. Um, if you look at any big organization, schools, that's generally where where it's at, and we're very consistent with that number. So gotcha. that's what we would be there. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Any more questions? Yeah. I just so. Yeah. I know you all. I'm, I'm not being negative, so let me put that out there. But I, I guess what I'm trying. So we we all support. Um, community involvement in the process and this specific to this hiring process when I talk about community I'm talking about the administrators that are here the students etc but at the end of the day this the person reports to the superintendent and when I look at this process I was just thinking about too many cooks in the kitchen um, it, it's are we taking and Holly I know you support this but isn't this kind of like so we have some checks and balances yeah, this time. So, for example, before before candidates go to the first round, I, I will have vetted that, yes, they meet all the minimum requirements. Like their okay. HR, DEI, myself, these people meet all the minimum requirements. There, there you go. It's not that I'm, I'm not taking myself out of this process. I just want to make sure that the people who are going to work 
with the principal, the, uh, the person, the, the people that are going to be directed by right. the principal have an opportunity to weigh in. But I'm not taking myself out of this process. I may actually sit in on all the interviews. Right, I was wondering yeah. that because the way this reads to me is yeah. like your responsibility in yeah. terms of making this decision has really been watered down. And it is my decision. Yeah, and, I and that's that why I was very like, clear. like, it is my decision, but it has to be a decision that's informed by Yep, how the administrators feel, how our students feel, and like, and that was really the what drove my decision the last time is the feedback that I got from students, the feedback that I got from teachers, the written feedback, the feedback that I got from my administrators was there was no, no clear consensus, and I didn't feel comfortable. So, gotcha. um, but yes, it, it is. Thank you. It is my decision. I'm not taking myself out of this process but it's important that everybody has right. a chance to weigh in. And you're also gonna be involved in the process, in the sure. vetting process. It's sure. not that you're just going to be interviewing the finalists no. and that it, that's uh -huh. it, okay. That's right. Yeah, and the way, and she's, so if you look at the, the initial, um, mm -hmm. she'll be involved in mm -hmm. that. And then when you look at the second round, you'll probably be involved mm -hmm. in that with the vice principal, that'll probably be, that's in a perfect world, it, it, it should be the part of that. Right. And then on the third round, then they'll have the one-on-one -on -one as well. So she'll be part of many interviews plus the vetting process. So she'll be in there a lot. It just doesn't spell it out exactly, right. but every single mm -hmm. Thank you. Great, thank you. And more questions, comments? Well, thank you for um, explaining this to us. I think it's, it's very helpful for mm -hmm. all of us to know what, what this process is going to look like and what to expect. I appreciate that. Okay, next up. I love this. Disclosure for school committee know, December just, dinner. It sounds so mysterious. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't even know if school committee members know what oh, this is. No. This, this I is want to know. This is a fun one. Um, so for our school committee, I'm not going to tell you exactly what we're, they're serving because they like it to be a little bit of a surprise, okay. but they are making a meal that requires the use of wine in cooking. The alcohol will cook out. So there's it's, but I need to purchase. One, I need to. I need to use school funds to purchase wine for the purposes of cooking. So this is a disclosure to let you know that if you see a case of wine on your on the oh credit goodness. card statement, that I haven't lost my mind. Thank and you. Yeah, nothing nefarious is going on. So I just uh, just to be full transparency, I wanted to let you know that we are going to use school funds and the chefs told me that if you don't use the real wine, the taste just isn't as good. The alcohol will <laughs> yeah. all cook okay. out. So. All right. <laughs> I don't think we're worried about that. I, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's doing the cooking, I guess? Well, is it Chef Peterson? Chef, Peterson. Peterson. Oh, Chef uh, Tessier. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep an eye on that. Well, I guess, <laughs> right. you know, if you don't use it all, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. question right. number one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be doing what they cook the dinner. Yeah. Like but our right. students, <laughs> students are not going to be handling that portion of the cooking, or are we going to teach? Are they going to learn some of that? They have used wine in cooking before. Okay. okay. Yeah. It's not. It's not unusual. It's it, it, Yeah. They're super. Biased. Is it just yeah. a cooking wine, or is it? What are they it's asking for? Not that it matters. Nice I tell you, if I tell yeah, you, yeah, then you'll know what it is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm trying, guys. I'm. Yeah. <laughs> so. It's a special meal. It is. It is. Okay. Next up is advertising and SPAC playbills. <laughs> Okay. So when we get to the subcommittee uh, uh, discussions later, we're going to talk about the policy um, where we have a policy that limits um, publishing of advertisements in school publications. So um, out of the abundance of caution, we're asking you um, to approve the use of advertising in our SPAC theater playbills because they do sell advertising to raise money. And so... Okay. Um, just asking they for that. also support the places that give That's donations, correct. and That's it's very correct. important to recognize the donations that we're doing. That's correct. Um, so move to approve the use of advertising in Southeastern SPAC theater bills in order to fundraise for the participants and performances. Second. All right. Any further discussion? If not, let's bring it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Ayes have it. 8 0. Thank you. Thank you. And then moving on to our unofficial election results. So I'm not going to go through all of these, but the, um, the election results are still unofficial. We are still waiting for, in particular, 
the count from Sharon, there were some write-in votes. Um, There's no candidate on the ballot, um, but but we do know that um, Sharon had write-ins, okay. and other towns also had write-in votes for the Sharon rep. So I'm sure that they are looking at counting them and making sure that the write-in candidate actually resides in Sharon. Do you have to get a certain amount of votes as a write-in candidate? More than the other person. More than the other person. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, like, well, and then there's a minimum. The, yeah. There's a minimum for them to even count. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's yeah. yeah, it's very small. Yeah. But yeah. yep. And also a reminder to folks: um, once the votes are certified, make sure that you um, you get sworn in before the next meeting. Yeah. Can you make a point to let our communities know that? They vote on every single person today at this table and not just mm. yeah. There's so many people that do not know. I know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's really I know. We try like at every big event. I always try and say, is it your school for the reps? That represent all of you. I, would, I, would, I, would, I think it's like, right. it says it on the direction. You know, forum when there is elections. Well, and they only vote for the first person. Right. Right. Okay. So we're moving on now um, to the integrated monitoring review of Southeastern Regional. So this is a required notice to our um, school committee, and we send this notice out to all of our our, our um, it's posted on our website. It's available in um, all of our major languages, and this is a regular, regularly conducted um, monitoring review. Um, of our special education services in particular. So um, they'll be here this week. Um, they'll be doing interviews. They'll be reviewing documents. Um, they may reach out to parents and caregivers um, just sort of randomly based on what they're seeing in our document process, and then they'll produce a report. Now, have they met with CPAC yet? Because I know that's usually they, required. I think they're going, I, I okay. don't think they have yet. Okay. No, I don't think they have yet. So any questions on this? This is a uh, Group B review too. So what is it? Three years ago they did Group A, yeah. and then they they flip mm -hmm. it every three years. Mm -hmm. so. All right. Good. Sounds good. Um, next up is the report of the committees. My report is very short. Um, I believe it's in our best interest not to meet on the fourth. Tuesday of November and December, unless <laughs> people really want to do that. Um, so what I'm going to do is defer um, subcommittee meetings that are going to be scheduled on the fourth week to January, where we're going to do athletics and then people and culture. Um, we will find a place for policy because the other thing that um, we were discussing was um, bringing in the um, bringing in the students who had presented on AI to figure out what our AI policy should be. Um, so it would be a good time to, to speak with them and, and have and challenge them with crafting a policy that we might want to um, tailor and, and adopt. So that that's to be continued. Is the policy meeting you said? Yeah, when we do the policy, okay. but the yeah. policy meeting has not been scheduled. It okay. will be after the new year. And I think everything else that I could talk about will probably be covered in our legislative liaisons report because there was an MCAS ballot question. Uh, <laughs> really? <right. laughs> oh yeah, oh. Yes, yes, that one. That one, <laughs> yes. Okay. All right, so on to our uh, legislative liaisons report. Uh, before I begin my report, I just want to mention that uh, in discussion with many of the people at the conference, we decided we would like the chef from Southeastern Regional to be engaged to cook for us the next year. Oh. Oh, <laughs> we don't know if that's possible, Every but year. <laughs> that may not be. <laughs> uh, uh, so last week, um, Together with uh, Robin and Gerson, um, we attended the MASC Mass Joint Conference in Hyannis. It began the day after the election, so there was much discussion, as you can imagine. But one of the featured speakers was Tim Shriver. Now, Tim Shriver is an educator, but you might remember his father, Sergeant Shriver, and his mother, Eunice Kennedy. Mm. Eunice Kennedy was founder of the Special Olympics. And if you saw Tim, right away you would say, that's a Kennedy. He looked just like them. And in fact, he referenced the fact that he was often mistaken for a Kennedy. And sometimes it would be a good thing, receiving positive uh, results, and sometimes uh, negative. But his presentation um, really, I thought, was 
very good to uh, begin the day after the election. And I, I gave out um, the Dignity Index, I think, uh, that some of you have. Um, and his presentation was about dignity and the Dignity Index, uh, which really spoke to many of us um, in the audience. Now, the highest level of, if you have the uh, paper, uh, the Dignity Index, and I quote, each one of us is born with inherent worth, so we treat everyone with dignity no matter what. And I think that's something we can all benefit from. And this can could you, I'm sorry to interrupt you, could you explain what the Dignity Index is for folks who might not have this um, piece of paper? Sure. Uh, it's really uh, for uh, people to be able to hear the other side. Often um, we tend to listen only to what we want to hear, but it's necessary to hear the other side. And it's not, uh, it's in all relationships, he said, um, between husband and wife. Sometimes you have conflict, but you have to listen to what your spouse says uh, and be able to work with that person in a positive way. The same thing classmate to classmate, teacher and student, school committee members and others in our life. So that, um, and that's not an easy thing to do sometimes. Uh, I don't know how people feel. Who has difficulty sometimes speaking to people that are so different from us? We're not going to answer that publicly. Good question. Well, it's true, but um, you know, I, I think. Um, here at Southeastern, from what I'm hearing from um, the teachers and others, there is a definite looking, and it happens in what we're talking about in people and culture or whatever, to really understand others coming from a different place. So, um, and we must treat everyone with dignity, and that, um, and these, the index. Um, you know, it goes from one to eight. So eight was the highest level. One was not not something that we want to even think about. One is they're not even human. It's our moral duty to destroy them before they destroy us. So obviously, this is something that uh, we want to steer away from. So we hopefully we don't start from one. I mean, we probably are all start from somewhere in the middle. And the highest point is what, what I just talked about in eight. So we need to fully engage with people, discuss values and interests, um, and share. And, and admit, this is very hard. It's hard to admit, maybe I was wrong. Maybe what I was thinking isn't true. Uh, and I think at that point, that opens up the conversation. Now you can talk to that other person, and that person might say back to you, you know, I was feeling kind of the same way, but now I'm looking at you in a different way. So, um, you know, and these are not things that are easy to do. Anyone who um, deals with any kind of conflict or difference in opinion understands that it's difficult, and I, I think we all know that um, our, our country has been very polarized, um, and sometimes uh, we have difficulty understanding that. Um, this is a time in the country that, well, at least for me, that um, I haven't, I don't remember anything quite like this, but, um, and that's important to think about this, because we, we really don't want to um, think of other people as the other. And we, we talk about that here. We want everyone to belong. We want people to feel good. So that's what Thank I you. kind of uh, am taking away from uh, that. Um, so there were two major issues that we were interested in that were discussed at the conference. Of course, ballot question two, 
which states, of course, that elimination of MCAS as a high school graduation requirement. The voters said yes overwhelmingly. Um, with, and the MTA, the Massachusetts Teachers Association, the MASC, the Massachusetts uh, School Committees, uh, they were very much for a yes on question two. And um, Robert and I talked with Glenn Kucher. He was the, uh, he's the executive director of MASC. And he was very elated uh, at the fact that people voted yes. Um, and also, you know, there's a lot been written about it. There, there's, you know, I, I've got a lot of material on who's saying what. The people I know <laughs> were Mara Healy, the Secretary of Education, who I hope, um, I was actually here when he visited and he, he was very impressed with the fact that we have diversity and so forth. Um, and uh, we hope that uh, he's somebody that can be an advocate for us. The business community was a no and the, the superintendents were a no. Not Holly, but... Uh, Mass Association of School Superintendents. Right, but the, su yeah. the superintendents um, and I did speak to one of them, uh, and uh, she didn't want to be quoted. <laughs> um, on the national scene, and I, I'm kind of too much to talk about this, but people were talking about it, so I, I will mention it very quickly. There were people concerned um, that uh, there was a pledge uh, from the uh, president-elect to dismantle the Department of Education. And um, that may not happen, so I think we don't need to spend too much time on that. But we all know Title I gives state and local funding uh, for schools serving low-income families and, and uh, the Pell Grant and many other things. Um, so we're, I'm hoping that that will not be a priority. There, there are so many other things that may be focused on, so we won't worry about that right now. And then our major issue that we faced um, was discussed at length at the Division 8 meeting that was really highly attended. There wasn't a seat to be had there. And uh, this issue continues to be an uphill fight since Senator Cronin introduced it. So they were talking about ways to counter to the fact that um, we feel the lottery would be detrimental to not only our vote school, but others. So they talked about engaging with those who need convincing. But this was interesting. They said, it cannot just be superintendents speaking. We need third party validators to speak, members of our advisory board, businesses who hire uh, for co-op programs, and the local business community who really understand the importance of not having kids in Vogue schools who may be around dangerous equipment, who have problems that would relate to that, whether it's uh, behavior or whatever. So um, they want everyone to take part. So I guess, and, and we have people that can do that. So I think we will call on them. So they are calling on all of us to take action, get involved, make our voices heard. Uh, the other uh, piece of the admission conversation and I think we all read uh, the, the other threat. Uh, Desi is again undertaking uh, once again to revise uh, admissions policy. Um, they want, uh, there was a letter that came out. I think we all read the letter uh, that Holly sent out um, where they're uh, going to give uh, special grants, but not to us if we're not um, schools that are lottery based, which. Um, I don't know. Will that happen? I'm not sure. I'm not sure that. I'm not sure that. I'm not sure if that's going to happen. That, but so. there was a letter. Yeah. Quid pro quo. And we also, of course, need to convince yeah. the governor and um, the secretary of education. Maybe he changed his mind a little when he came here. But all in all, it, it's an all-court press. And I guess we need everyone to really work on this. Who, where, and when? 
I can have a, a series of businesses bombarding with emails. You should. We should totally see what we can do with our business partners. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Just yeah. even like statements, I guess, written to you. Well, I did a survey of the advisory board uh, yeah. about the lottery, and yeah. I have that data to present, and they are strong, strongly opposed to a blind admissions lottery. Um, so the um, Karen McGuire from Tri County and I are. I'm presenting at the Board of Education study session on Monday night. Um, the regular board meeting follows that next Tuesday morning, but it's being held in Holyoke. Um, well, they're going there to um, rec uh, recognize Holyoke for coming out of receivership, and uh, I just so it's let myself yeah. Because of how far it is, I know. Yeah, it's gosh. really far. But I do think that you know it, it can't just be because it looks like um, that we're being protectionist when it's just right. the superintendent standing up there, and it's like you know. And I think when you do hear from business partners, right, and the other people, students, when you hear from you know. Maybe about why it's not senators. why it's not good for kids. I think that's what's being lost in all of this. Is yeah. it's easy to see why one or the other is good for school. Why is it not good for kids? And, right? and do we have students that are willing to voice what the application process meant to them? So when I did the survey with the advisory board, mm -hmm. there were quite a number of students that that responded. Um, the the detail they provided wasn't wasn't. As yeah. detailed as I would like, but um, we could certainly do a school wide. I mean, know. I'm just saying for even like when we do your legislative breakfast, when those people mm -hmm. are here and just have like a presentation from mm -hmm. the students that are here and the effects it has. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. If that's that's interesting, yeah. One, one of the biggest problems with that is we have a legislative breakfast and it's great, it's a great time, but it's an echo chamber. Yeah. The only people that yeah. come here are the people that support us, not the people that are against us. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a big blood giant echo chamber sometimes. Yeah. Um, not that it's a bad thing to do. I mean, it's great to have them involved, but. Yeah. One thing they said, and I see was supporting, was local control. In other words, district by district. There are some districts that are way out of whack on their demographics. Oh, yes, that's true. And, Sorry. and the thing is, maybe they have, to, they have to look at their policies because they are definitely discriminatory. Ours are. Correct. We, we really reflect our district, and we should be judged differently than the ones that are out of whack. Yeah, I mean, I agree that they can't really do that, but um, there's no, other than emailing right now, there's no action that our communities could technically mm -hmm. take, right? So, mm -hmm. like, there's no vote actions, there's no, like, the only thing you could do is capacity. request to be placed on the Board of, of Education um, agenda for public comment. And I believe they limit it to it's ten public comments per per session or something like that. Um, but you could do that. Um, certainly, you know, email is not an ineffective way to let people know that that you care about the issue. Um, you know. well, one small way that I think people can. Uh, voice their support on this is to sh um, be there for the meeting. It's a virtual meeting on Monday. Um, right. Oh yes, and it's open that, to the public. So if that if makes a difference, yeah. it's so, like, yes. With any yeah. legislators, they yeah. Yeah. they count the number of uh, people and they right. count the number of messages in, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll sometimes the, we'll send the link out. Yeah. Um, the link doesn't. I think they shut off comments right last yeah. time. Mm -hmm. Um, oh yeah. So you, you, you couldn't, you couldn't, you couldn't sign in. You couldn't whatever. But they can see how many people right. are participating. Oh yes, and that makes a difference. That definitely right. makes a difference. Yeah, for sure. Substantial. That's a good point. And then we do have three superintendents who are lined up to speak on that Tuesday in Holyoke. So just to kind of keep us in front of the board as well. But. So we have to keep it up. And then they, uh, at the end, uh, they uh, concluded with appreciation for Division 8 and everything that the uh, different groups in there and MASC and MAVA, who um, is working as hard as they can um, in support of opposition to the lottery. And one more thing. They, uh, <laughs> there's a challenge to our design group to design a Division 8 insignia, and uh, there'll be a competition between the schools, and um, there'll be a modest prize, something like a gift card to Amazon, but um, anyone 
if you know, you know, you can let them know. Anyone who's interested to let Holly know, and um, they can work is on that. Is there a, a link? Is there a information we could share? Because we could share it with our um, advertising design group. That would be oh, great. That's a great too. idea. I think we got yeah, I would like to see idea. us yeah. work on that. Good. Great. So all in all, it really, I think we found it to be, you know, a very interesting. Uh, and a good uh, conference. I was uh, telling uh, Tony that uh, we went to something on belongingness, which fits mm -hmm. right into people and culture and how that feels. So that was good. And what was probably the best, most, uh, <laughs> uh, the, the thing that made us feel the best was, I don't know if you know Jimmy Tingle. He's a comedian. comedian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know who that is? Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize it. Uh, he's a local comedian. Uh, I think he uh, grew up uh, in South Boston or and, and so forth. But he was, uh, I guess he's been around for a long time. I didn't know him that well, but he was on the Johnny Carson show when he was on 60 Minutes. But he had everyone laughing. And I think, you know, there was a point in, at the conference that that was necessary. So we appreciated that as well. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Any questions for Barbara? Next up, um, actually, Chair Branch, I think you're on double duty here. We got policy sub, and then yeah. after that, people and culture. So I'll let's start clear. with policy, um, because we have a motion that we need to to do. So um, did my own, well, actually, I was going to ask you if you want to, I could be one minute on people and culture, okay. but I need your approval to skip to that agenda item. Sure, let's move, um, let's see what number that is. Because Holly's going to have to go over that change. Yeah, so I'm, I'm we'll go 9D out of order, so we'll do 9D first. So we've, we've talked about pe pe people and culture, and for those that are listening, for our new school committee, a person is really about making sure, with respect to the mission of people and culture, that everyone has a voice, is one thing, but also to make sure that everyone at this particular um, district is heard, and I think that we are accomplishing that. One of the things that I loved about the Dignity Index, it gives the best language, dignity, number eight. Each of us is born with inherent worth, so we treat everyone with dignity no matter what. And that's, so, that's really what our work is about with respect to people and culture. Um, when we started on this journey, we talked a little bit about, or maybe a lot about data, um, what the students were thinking, what staff was thinking, and then we narrow it down to what we should be looking at is the uh, school readiness assessment. Uh, some of that conversation happened today, but it happened as early as that meeting, I think it was October uh, 29th, to really look at how we can build a communication plan to make sure that this gets out to our school community. So that's what we're talking about, and that's what we're working on. One of the things that I love about this organization, and, and I'm so, so committed um, to helping with this work, is that people are really working from their heart. Uh, this is not a political stunt. This is professionals that are committed to making sure uh, that our students are respected, that are also making sure that they are respected as staff members uh, under Holly's leadership. So uh, people uh, in culture was such an important subcommittee that we developed here. And I just want to, again, thank everyone for um, allowing it to be in existence. But again, data, we need data. Um, one of the things that I love about Holly, we don't have to reinvent the wheel because the work we had already been done. Uh, so as we build a communication plan around this that meets uh, the linguistic requirements because of the communities that we serve, I think we're going to do very, very well um, in moving forward. And I think that's the gist of my report. If I've missed anything, charge it to my mind, not to my heart. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So then we'll go to 9C, um, so the policy subcommittee meeting. So policy is a little bit more straightforward. Um, we are reviewing policies that, as, our requir as we are required to do, many of the language are, are needs to be, excuse me, some of the language needs to be changed that's been that has been redacted or stri stricken. Holly can go over some of the details, but specifically, we worked on policy LA and uh, KA. I didn't <coughs> see if we were going to do something around um, Oh, uh, I forgot what it was. Okay, I'll forget about it because I forgot what it was. 
Yeah. If you remember, let me know. Yeah, I don't think. We, upped, we had a few policies that we updated. Something that you mentioned earlier today that oh, we. Yeah, it had to do with the, the SPAC playbill. Yes, that's what. Okay, oh, right. yes. I didn't yes, see yes. that here. That's why I was okay. confused. All Thank right, you. So, Holly, please. Thank you. So um, we have been going through a, sort of a continual review of our policy book. Um, and we rely, as a lot of school districts do, on MASC. One of the great uh, values that it brings to school districts is that it does a regular review of policies and updates them in case there are changes in laws or regulations so that we're not constantly doing that. And then they also go through and say, oh, this policy is just poorly written. We're going right. to fix it. So that's this first one. They've just rewritten it to be more readable. Um, so nothing has changed there. Um, we did make some changes to the request for outside projects um, policy because what was written uh, didn't align with what we were currently doing and um, just didn't make sense. <laughs> so we rewrote that to see it be more in line with um, how we actually look at um, outside po projects. And we're really talking about construction projects and things for, for our communities. Um, so that's been updated. And then we got rid of a lot of stuff that didn't need to be there. Some of this is just um, being more inclusive in our language. Um, we, we do have um, families that come in various uh, different configurations and so trying to be um, thoughtful about that. Um, no no uh, substantive changes to um, non-custodial parent rights, just making it more readable again. Uh, relationships with parent organizations. So we just kind of made it a little bit clearer um, that if a parent organization, like for example an athletic booster club, wanted to start here, they need to organize as a 501c3 first and then there's there's a process for that. So just sort of laying out like if a parent organization wanted to um, organize um, and, and contribute here, that's what they would have to do. Um, that's just an old policy that gifts from the public, um, you know, we, we go through that process um, at every school committee meeting. Donations have to be accepted by the school committee. There has to be some value to us. And the reason that we do that is so people don't just give us a bunch of stuff we don't need. Um, so they do have to go through a, a process for that. Um, we have updated this to ensure that um, people know that our records um, access officer information is on our about page of our website. So that was added. It's not in blue here, Tony, but uh, I added it at the bottom. And one of, the, um, one of the things that we found out when we were looking at this policy, guess who the um, access officer is? It's Holly. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, do that's something that. that can't be delegated. To I, I do. I, I take the, I get the request, but I delegate the. You do okay. Okay. All right. Because yes. I know we we're talking about check against the goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Nope. Nope. Um, I was the records access officer before, so it kind of makes it just, sense yeah, to yeah. just leave it there. But no, I delegate that out. I give them the due date. I put a tickler on my calendar and then I circle back. Go. But everybody's very good about that. They take those very seriously. Um, community use of digital resources. It's just talking about like we have Wi-Fi, we have, you know, um, but it, it's, it, it's not just out there for anybody to use. It's, it's a privilege um, for members of the community. We don't have to give you the password, you know, you know those kind of things. Um, we do make it reasonably available. Um, no change to this one. It was actually updated earlier this year. Um, and this is, again, just wordsmithing to make it, you know, a little bit easier to read, that we're going to, you know, we're reasonably cooperative with the news media. We promote the school. We respond to requests for information from them um, and things like that. So, um, Public concerns <coughs> updated this because the public has a right to, to tell us what they think about how things are going yeah. and the word complaint has, a, like has some negative connotations right. <laughs> to it about the person who's giving the feedback, right? So it's, it's really just trying to think in a more positive way about the um, uh, uh, information, questions and concerns that are raised. So um, 
the only place we left complaints is is if it's anonymous because those generally are just complaints um, so that second part of it doesn't have to be there so anything that's like one of these um, KEE -E, that's an exhibit we don't actually need to have those in the policy book um, public uh, complaints about school personnel that was actually rolled up into the previous one same thing here Um, community use of school facilities we just went through here and aligned it with our current policies um, because we do have a supervisor maintenance conferences and events and he is the point person for all of that um, and just saying that we do give priority for mm -hmm. um, like if the town of Easton wants to hold the meeting here um, we would give them priority over you know, New York City or something. Um, oh, this one we will take out. This has the exhibit should be all red because that's just going down into the rules once you rent it, and we have a separate document for that. We have a separate rental agreement, so all of that will be out. The rental rates are a separate document. All of this is part of uh, Bob Riley's process for when he rents the helps us rent facilities. All of this is just redundant um, public solicitation so again we don't allow um, commercial activities um, in, the, in the school anything and this comes up quite a bit around um, charitable giving for example um, the school committee has to approve any charitable fundraising in the school and it's important that they do that um, this is the one we were speaking about earlier advertising in the school um, right. so right. Um, we don't allow excessive advertisement but some advertisement in you know the SPAC playbill and things is helpful for us to to uh, um, earn money for the kids um, visitors to the school this is really an MASE policy that was written more for <coughs> like elementary school parents or, or, or guardians so we updated it that you know if you want to visit the school you go through the lobby guard and you know, it happens so infrequently I mean unless you're an invited guest it would be very weird for people to show up and just want to go sit in a classroom um, relations with booster organizations again that was sort of rolled up into a previous policy that we looked at and then we did rewrite this one um, relations it used to be with police authorities and we just updated it to law enforcement um, and we talk about you know that we have a school resource officer and that the um, roles and responsibilities of the school resource officer versus like behavior management is in our memorandum of understanding and I provided a link to the model, model uh, SRO MOU, which is what we use with the town of Easton to support our, our SRO relationship, which is very positive. And this one, it's just is an outdated policy. Um, school committee has to get along with everybody, so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, just the planning board. Uh. But so it's included in this one <laughs> relations with local governing authorities. So I don't know if there are any questions about K policies. Any questions, comments? Only comment that I have is, and I'm looking right at it. Thank you, Deb, and thank you, Holly, because <laughs> this is the work you all had to reconcile these policies. Thank you, thank you. Well, and thank you, Policy Sub, too. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> All right. L is much shorter. <laughs> yes, I, I just love um, L is, uh, L, uh, LA is just a wordsmithing. Mm -hmm. um, same with LB. And LBC is yeah. doesn't apply to uh, to regional vocational schools. So that is it for our policy review. All right. Well, so this is. Oh, this should be moved yes. to accept, right? That's right. So yeah, this is well. It says the first reading. Somebody did cut paste. Not too well. <laughs> um. Usually goes to the full committee for the first reading. Oh, yeah, I know. I mean, do we need a second reading? That's in 
here. No, I don't think no, that's put in your motion. You all know what I'm asking. Well, so I'll I mean, we, the second reading. So right, I, I think that well, the technically what we're supposed to do is move to suspend the rules and then move, but instead of going through all that complication. So I, I'm going to just make this. So I'm going to move to recommend to the full school committee to accept the policies as presented with the revisions and updates, k &L policies recommended by the policy subcommittee on October 29, 2024. That is my motion. And so you are you going to waive the second? And wave the second reading. Right, well, that's why I said it like that, and wave the second, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and wave the second reading. Right. Correct. Okay. So the way I said it would, would have been what it's we implemented. Right. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. I second. Good. All right. Any further discussion? Second. <laughs> that was a third. Oh, yeah. third. All right, let's, third. Bring to, let's bring it to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? I have it. Eight. Thank Zero. you. All. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, other reports. I'm just wondering, um, Chair Montero, if you could just give a status update on negotiations, please. Oh. Oh, it's. That's it. Let's go. All right. We have a meeting. 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 We have a Okay. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Check. Check. Awesome. All right. Any other reports that I've that we missed? Mm, no. Not. We'll move to the report of the superintendent. Okay. I have a fun report. <laughs> Thank oh, you. Okay. All right. All right. All right. A fun report. So as you know, um, back in I believe February or March, the school committee um, approved um, the use of some mm -hmm. some funding that had been uh, in, available for Irish studies for about 20 years and um, allowed Mark Morris and Katie Tuchinardi and, and I to go to um, Ireland with a group of, it was a total of 19 educators. Um, some were assistant principals, principals, superintendents, uh, a couple of retired superintendents, which was interesting, um, and to visit uh, schools in Ireland. So um, we arrived on a Sunday. Um, we spent one full day sort of sightseeing in, well, we arrived on Saturday, spent the Sunday sort of sightseeing, and then um, started our school visits um, on that Monday. So the goal was to really learn about the education systems in Ireland and, and Northern Ireland, so those are two different countries. Um, understand the impact of history and culture on the systems, focus uh, in particular on special student services, and then also explore how um, career technical education is incorporated into their education systems. Um, so we visited a school that's Mark uh, Morris. While we were there, it was Math Week or Maths Week, as they say in Ireland. Um, and the student was um, doing a magic trick based on math that they had just learned from a magician who visited um, that morning. So um, the school we visited was an all boys primary school. All of the students were from low income families. One of the things that we learned while we were there is that schools are very, very segregated based on income. And to have a school like ours where you have students who are lower income, middle income, and higher income all together, it, it doesn't, they could not compute because it's very uh, community based. And if your community is poor, your school is poor. If you're oh. so, um, there are special programs from the government to sort of help um, economically disadvantaged schools. Um, they had a huge focus on attendance, just because of a lot of the stuff that kids were having to deal with at home. Um, they like as soon as you walk in the door, it's like the grade four has 95% attendance today. Grade six has. Um, um, the schools are all still mostly segregated by religion. So this was a uh, Catholic school. You don't have to be Catholic to go there, but also on the wall were pictures of the boys' first communion classes. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was an interesting, very different from, from our public school um, system. And we learned that teacher salaries are set by the national government. 
um, and they are the same, like the teacher salaries are the same whether you live in Dublin or Connemar or wherever there. And they're, the average teacher salary is about $40,000 a year. Um, and their cost of living is lower, but it's, it's not that much lower. So that was an interesting um, uh, fact. Uh, the second school we visited was called Swords Secondary School. Um, this serves kids from about 12 or 13 to 18. Uh, they told, told us about their leaving cert, which is their exam that they have to pass to graduate. And when I tell you that they teach to the test, they teach to the test. We sat in, a, in an English classroom where they were literally like, you have to start your your essay with a quote. So find a quote that you really like, three or four quotes that can fit into a lot of different, um, you know, topics, and memorize those. You have to start with a quote. Then they want to see this, and then they want, and it was, oof. So um, we've we've never gotten there with with NCAS. So that was real teaching to the test. To graduate, what I thought was interesting is they test in their core academic subjects. Um, but they also have to pass three exams in practical subjects. So they, if they did culinary arts or home ec, they called it, they had to cook for someone and they were judged on their cooking. They could do arts, they could do uh, metalworking, but they had to do three practical exams to um, graduate from high school. I thought that was good. Um, but generally, and Mark can weigh in on any of this also, um, there was no pure CVTE um, at the secondary level. It's all really introductory, pre-vocational. Um, if you really want to take that career path, it is post-secondary. And it's three or four years post-secondary. Um, so they had some very basic woodworking, drafting, which they were still doing by hand, um, and some metalworking uh, there. The Houston Street School in Belfast is probably my favorite school. Um, they, have an, they have a very diverse student population, a lot of immigrants. The day we got there, they had just welcomed a family from Gaza. Um, extremely limited resources. And what we saw across the board is that they tended to have pretty good teacher staffing levels. They tended to have pretty good paraprofessional staffing levels. What they didn't have were adjustment counselors or uh, any like ESL, those kind of things. That was just almost non-existent. Mm -hmm. So this particular school gets a school adjustment counselor three hours, one day a week. And they have to decide who gets adjustment counseling services. So what they do is they just train the entire school in trauma-informed teaching practices so that they're all sort of working to the best of their ability with, with students. Um, and really what we saw across the board was very limited resources for anything extra. The first school we went to, they told us they are allowed three special education assessments per year. Other than that, parents would have to pay on their own and none of their parents could afford to pay. Um, so what they do is they take the bottom 10% of kids, 10, the lowest performing 10%, and they just treat all of them as if they have special um, education needs. And that's, that's how it goes. So um, we found that almost entirely across the board, um, except for this school. This is the Ardnishy School in Derry, Northern Ireland. And it is a school entirely for kids with special needs. Um, and we, when we first got there, they gave us a great presentation about their shared value and their shared mission, and it was awesome. And, and then they took us to see the choir. Every morning the kids come in, and they sing for, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. It wasn't a long, long time. But they were, it was amazing. Any kid can participate, and then there you can't really see it, but in the back they had like a solo mic set up, and if you wanted to sing solo, you just ask, and you got to go up and you could sing solo, and I mean, they knocked it out of the park. Um, they had a very strong commitment to professional development. Teacher led professional development every Monday after school for an hour and a half. Um, so this school was actually pretty well funded. They had an arrangement with the park next door 
to use all their parkland so they could take kids out um, into nature and, and had some wonderful facilities. But absolute excellent, excellent teaching staff. And then we went to this school that I cannot pronounce. Um, it was an Irish speaking school out in the western part of the, of the country, Connemara. Um, and um, they, I would say all the schools that we went to showed a particular attention to needs of students on the autism spectrum. So um, their little hanging plant thing there, that word in Irish means tranquility. Um, every school had like sensory rooms, um, like, you know, places where the kids could go bounce off the walls if they needed to, like just really thoughtfully designed um, spaces, even in, the, even in the schools that were struggling um, for students who um, had sensory needs and students on the autism spectrum. So, um, and this was the one place where the principal who's there at the top told us that they were really starting to see kids become more interested in um, career technical education. And um, he was like, one of our brightest students has decided they're not going to college, they want to be an electrician. I was like, yes. So I think they're starting to see the need as, as well. So that was a very uh, interesting, um, interesting school. So I just wanted to say thank you um, on behalf of Mark and Katie. Uh, we had a really great trip. We learned a lot. We, we had a great group of people who um, were really all there for the right, right reasons. And we did get to see a little bit of Ireland along the way. So thank you very much. I wanted to present that to you. And, and um, thank you for, for giving us a, a really incredible opportunity. So, so now here comes the question. Mm -hmm. Okay. So whenever somebody is sent off on a PD trip, right, we always ask them, like, well, what what are you bringing back? I will tell you what I'm bringing back. Okay. Oh, shoot. I just closed it. Hang on. <laughs> the one thing that I'll, I, it was my one biggest point, and I forgot to mention it. Hang on. So the thing that stood out to me the most um, was how intentional, it may not come up, how intentional each of the schools was about their core values and their mission and how very clear it was in every school that we walked into who they were and what they were about and what they stood for. And the one school that I, I thought really nailed it, hang on, uh, for me, was this was the Houston Street School. So this is the very diverse, uh, lots of immigrants, lots of students who do not speak English as their primary language. So as soon as you walked in, they had a big banner that um, is the UNICEF Commission on the Rights of the Child. Oh. And that's that's right there. And it's it's there in other languages too. I, I took a picture of the, of the one in English. Then all around the school, you'll see like um, this little sign here. You know, this is the right of the month. And in October it was, you have a right to have friends and clubs. Um, and then you can't read the fine print, but it says we are a rights respecting school. We are achieving excellence together. Mm. Every classroom, the students and the teacher had decided from among those, those articles, those rights, which ones were important to them. And they had them posted on the doors you went in. They had them posted on walls in the classroom. And, you know, some of them were, you have a right to express your opinion and for people to listen to you. And it was just so intentional everywhere you went about who they were and what they were about. I saw that at the Arden Ishii School, the special education school. They had a very unified vision for who they were and how they were going to teach. And, and you, it wasn't them giving us a presentation and telling us this is who we are. You felt it in every room you went into, in every interaction, in the design of the school. And so what I brought back is that's who we are going to be, right? I think we're on our way there, but everybody should be able to walk in to Southeastern Regional School District and say, this is who Southeastern is, this is what we stand for, this is how we're gonna teach, this is how we're gonna treat one another, and it, it should just be, become so ingrained in our culture that nobody can make a mistake about it. So what I brought back is, intentionality and how important it is and how even a school that has no resources that you know they 
it's a hundred and something year old building it's a historic building they can't add on to it they can't change anything the roof is leaking it was, it's a lot there was passion and education and and it uh, it was great because they are united around a shared vision of who they are who their kids are and what they value so that's what i brought back i have a question yeah in that group of superintendents and other members were you all vocational bound or were you just regular no, we were the only vocational. Mm -hmm. So you guys were the only ones that understood like the need mm -hmm. for training mm -hmm. and education. Mm -hmm. And do they have? Did they share with you the amount of students that leave to go to college versus that post-secondary um, CBT training? They really didn't, and I'll tell you why. It's the attitude is if you don't pass your leaving cert or if you don't do well enough to get into the university, mm -hmm. then you go and you get a trade. They still had a very old fashioned idea mm -hmm. about what you're supposed to do post, so the, post secondary. So the expectation is mostly many of them go to college. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's the old uh, that's interesting for such like communities that just don't that are like low educated technically, like when it comes to their parents and older generations where it's just kind of lax. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting. It was. It was very interesting. So, but um, just oh. a yes, sir. No, just a quick question. Um, and I'm a little confused. Mm -hmm. So you showed us where the young adults or the kids were singing, had an opportunity to go to the microphone mm -hmm. solo. <coughs> you didn't do it. Mark didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just we, we, wondering why you didn't show Southeastern like on the like, international stage what yeah. you could do. Right. I mean, we felt like we were vocational training and we're professionally musically trained. There you go. Yeah. 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 We felt like we were traumatized. Oh. <laughs> and well, I'm just saying, oh, there's an opportunity there to shine. That's a, that would be a fun night, an open mic night here. Yeah. Oh, don't right it. No, no, no. <laughs> it's a good night for the kids. Yeah. We have the first two uh, the kids. Just, performers. Just wondering. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Mark, did you have anything you wanted to add? No, just really, I was really appreciative for one, again, you see what their vocational programs were. And, you know, I would appreciate it for the, for the school committee that we have, for the government, for the, the Department of Ed, the funding we have to give the opportunities to our students because a lot of these schools. You know, they were scrambling for whatever they could do, you know, to put together what they could do to give back to those students. And sometimes we take a little of that for granted, but I was really appreciative for what we had and the ability to go with vocational education and the CTE learning, those opportunities to give our students, because a lot of those students there, like, like Holly was saying, it was kind of like the second thought, right? So if you didn't pass, you didn't do well enough to get into college, then watch go look for a trade. Kind of mm -hmm. back the stigma wow. back in the early, early 70s and early 80s. I was really appreciative for that, for what we have, and the ability we have to give those opportunities to our students. So I think it was really an eye opener there. I do have one additional question. I know there are some schools that can do it, but when it comes to like exchange students, is there anyone that we can pair up with from those, like that community particularly, or other yeah. communities if we found sponsored families we had or anything an exchange like that? Student. No, uh, I, we haven't had one in a little while. So if, if yeah. the host parents were in Mansfield, yeah. um, for a long time, yes. I had a lot of them in class. Right, but they weren't they weren't necessarily through our school. It was just the that parent, right? Mansfield. It was mm -hmm. right off one yeah, six. Yeah, yeah, she used to take a uh, kid every year for. Yes. I I had seven huh. or eight of them. So it's based on like the parent, like the the families that want to take them in, and then yeah, yes. yeah. Can we do we have like if there was a parent that wanted to send them to this school, would we have the space to do that, or is that something that they would have to like go through the process? <laughs> We would take them above and beyond, so we take them above and beyond our students, like we do sometimes with um, you know, faculty. So they could only stay for one year, and we would put them in the junior year just because we would have to worry about MCAS. And, right. and, um, so, yeah. So they would have to MCAS at all now. So. <laughs> 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 they, 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 were anyway, they were always that. I mean, but they were always that. Yes, they were always that. The way they have <laughs> classes in most countries, are, it's like they get through. Know, everything that we're doing in 
a year, you know what I mean? Yeah. So they have this, some classes that we have over two years in one year, so they had the core requirements to, to be able to participate as an 11th grader. So and they was always old enough to do that, so. Yeah. It's not a bad yes. idea. Interesting. So we didn't, they didn't take the admission of anybody else, but we allowed them to come because yeah. Mansfield wouldn't allow them to come and they didn't have a space for them. So. Oh, they were, they were always great kids. I mean, they played on the lacrosse team. They, yeah, they were. Should look into that. I just yeah, wonder if there's like a part of like a family or put it out to the families. Like, does anyone want to yeah. participate in this program? Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah, when last year and the year before, there was. One, but they, um, the students, they still, have to, they still have to go through the admissions criteria, and there was like things that were missing in, in the end. You know, I didn't want to, just admissions being so tight, like you, I didn't want to go outside of what our policies were for anybody. So, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. you should probably develop a, well, we do. a foreign exchange student admissions policy. Yes, Tony. No, I, know, I would support well, that. Was it the yeah. same family? Yeah. Yeah. For one year. Yeah, yeah, it was the same family. Yeah. It was the same family that she would take students from different countries. No, I. Um, no. It, they did say like if you ever have a student that you know over Christmas break that you know wants to participate, can you let them do something like that? Mm -hmm. you know, so, um, so yeah, it was one particular family that would do that. Okay. Thank you. Um, just one point on MCAS. So currently, MCAS is still the law. Um, any ch the earliest that any changes can go into effect uh, is December the 5th, and we don't know that changes will actually go into effect. So, like, we administered MCAS retest today because gotcha. we're still required to administer MCAS for graduation purposes at this point. Um, so, you know, we will see uh, what happens. I think it's important to understand that with. Oh, MCAS being gone, it is now going to be up to Southeastern to set graduation criteria. Mm -hmm. So um, it gives some control back to um, the local school committee, um, but we'll have to have to have a, a tough look at what our graduation requirements are going to be. I don't know if Desi is going to come out with any kind of guidance. I don't, you know. That was one of the issues in the no votes. Yeah. They didn't like the fact that each district will decide. Right. They, it won't be uniform. Right. Yeah. And we are still required to administer it as a condition of receiving federal funding. For right. now. Right. For now. <laughs> we also don't know what the legislature is going to do with we, it. We don't. The legislature don't can really yeah. delay the <coughs> effective date of any changes. Because it's tough to, you know, as written, we would throw the MCAS out this year. Well, it's tough to do that when we're, you know, midway through the school year. But we shall see. Yep. Um, so as of right now, it is still required. And we, like, right, uh, Wednesday and Thursday after the election, we administered retest. Yep. retest. Today we administered retest. So um, we will Tomorrow we do. Tomorrow. Yep. Just got to keep going until you're told that's otherwise. Right. That's right. Um, all right. You're at the acting principal. Okay. So next up is the acting principal's report and principal for So as uh, Holly mentioned, we had math retest today. Um, we had the school council meeting last week, which was great. We invited um, our director of guidance, uh, Lois Miller, just to talk about, we had talked about the first meeting about what some priorities were for people and just understanding the guidance services and how they would get support. Mm. Um, and what is just understanding guidance and what do they do, what sort of the makeup, what do students have for um, access to their guidance counselor, what's the mental health services, what are some of the initiatives that we have. So we went over all of those and we um, left room for feedback from parents about communication, about you know their ability to meet with their guidance counselor, what's our, what's our college planning process, our career, college, uh, career process. Um, just so that people had a real understanding. We talked about, you know, maybe having some suggestions. What do other schools do that, you know, do they have children in other schools that they feel like that communication is really great or they had a good experience there. So it was just really nice to hear from families. It's, you know, again, we talked earlier about, you know, collaborating and really coming forward with an effort. You know, I think that everyone 
again, intentionally tries to do a really nice job with what we do. It doesn't mean that people have, who don't have a suggestion about something that they saw that was great at another school or could work better or different than we do. And so we sort of welcome those ideas and suggestions from people. Um, and this is what we currently do and if they have, they have anything. So what the parents did ask for was to go back on our website. We used to have it, it was a checklist. So in grade 10, you know, the families have a checklist of you know, all the things that they need to do for um, their child. Like even, even in grade 10, as early as grade 10, to start thinking about when their child might take driver's ed, you know, good student discount. Like do they think of like those things? And the same thing that I had mentioned earlier, they asked, if you could really just sort of take everything as if they know nothing, right? Explain like they know nothing, and so give links for them to click on to so that they could get more information about that. Like, where would I go to find that? So even though you're telling me, I might not know like how to drill down into any of that information. So we are going to take what we used to have for 10, 11, and 12, and 9, 10, 11, 12, and then just break that down a little further and then post that back on our website so that families have that. Um, they are also, uh, the guidance department is um, working with our um, vocational supervisors to do a Pathways to Possibilities, which is a career fair that will take place. Um, we do a uh, college fair. We're also going to start doing a career fair on January 21st from 8.30 to 11.30. Um, we had our fall advisory dinner, which was fantastic. Um, Mary and Jared and Jen Hall and Culinary did, did a really amazing mm -hmm. job. There were 230 guests there, so it was really nice to, to see. We have 193 students out on co-op right now <coughs> in the senior class. Um, admissions, we have uh, 902 applications as of before I left to come here. Um, so, um, so just a couple. Yeah, it's <laughs> before open house, but yeah. it's and it's again. Uh -huh. it's, I, I still think I know there's a lot of talk about the lottery and stuff. I, I still think that we should look at those things with pride. That people want to be here. They want to have the experience that you know that we get from our students and our staff and you know we don't take that lightly it's not it, it's really it just should be a compliment to the work that people do every day because they work really hard here and so um, and, and people hear that people go back to their community and say that this is how I feel as, as a student at Southeastern so they're telling their experiences and that's what where the applications are coming from so again we hate to say no to anybody but um, it's coming from a good place, so I don't I don't want to lose sight of that ever. Um, so November 23rd is our open house from 11 to 2. Um, Holly and I created over the summer sort of a plan of engagement, and just to engage with academic teachers to you know once a week make sure that we're in classrooms and looking at watching teachers and being part of. Um, they are every day teaching and having that experience with them being in and out of vocational programs which has been great and then we're going to start some employer visits um, in early December so that we can start to visit them and see what their experience is like with Southeastern um, get some feedback from them as well um, we developed strategic planning meetings that have started so that we can build a strategic plan um, and also data meetings so that we're talking about, we're looking specifically at our data and making decisions around that for um, everything that we do. So, and all of that is, is great, but I like to also, um, for me, is have, teacher, have meetings directly with teachers. So, for the past couple of weeks, I've been meeting with vocational teachers, I have several meetings tomorrow. Um, and then I will move to the academic departments. But one of the things that I'm looking for in the meetings is just to really listen to um, our teachers. What are you? What are, what are their strengths? Like, what are they really proud of that they accomplish that they do? Because sometimes we don't realize how much they do or how much they're capable of doing. Um, what are some of the barriers? What are some of the things that are getting in their way or, or can sort of stop them from doing the work that they want to do? Um, and what's their vision for the future, like of their program, how do they stay current in their field. Um, and the <coughs> responses have just been amazing. It's people are doing great, great work. Um, the things that they're looking for or need from us are very small or, you know, 
they need very little fuel, um, but the, some of the things that they do need are important to them. So uh, Jared and Mary have been awesome. They are creating their lists so we can sit down with Holly and, and just give this overall feedback of, you know, this is how well the school's doing. This is what people are doing. We talk a lot about, you know, when something goes wrong, but we don't talk enough about like all these great things that are happening um, in the school and that teachers are, are doing and are a part of. We um, are able to do the Project Playhouse. Um, Jared and the Carpentry Program have initiated that again for a two-year-old girl. We work with Bryant University to do that. The girl's name is Hope, who is battling cancer. Um, so if you saw the Playhouse last year, we built that big Playhouse that was the Little Mermaid theme. And this one, um, she is a Disney, just as you princesses, and uh, Minnie Mouse, and Coco Melon, I don't know <laughs> um, but she uh, she has a twin sister faith, so it should be a really nice if you can make it to that event. It's it's really heartwarming. Um, we are working with Habitat for Humanity, um, so we're getting out there um, as part of the community. Um, they we're still working on Smith Farm. They're doing a re rehab of the farmhouse, DW Field Park, the new Welcome Center. Um, and I just want to make a correction. So the, there is um, Jirai and them have a group um, that, again, they're starting like a student movement of, um, and I can release the podcast. I should be able to release it in the next day or so, but they want to do something for SET news. So I'll release it to you first before you know, I re release it, but it's, it's really excellent. And again, they're focused on making it cool to be a good student and a good person. Um, and they talk, their first couple of ones are about their experiences, where they come from, what experience that they had, they're shaped who they are and who they are today and where, where they want to go. Um, but there was a, the second podcast was the one with the Secretary of Education, so those are not the same students. So I just wanted to clarify from earlier that that was something that cybersecurity did and invited the Secretary of Education. So those are three seniors that were in that program that invited the Secretary of Education. So it's sort of, they both have the ability to do podcasts in video and performing and in there. So I don't want to, I didn't want to take away their credit from from their program, so they did a really, really nice job, and uh, it was amazing. I'm sorry, so can we just clarify that? So it's a school-run podcast where you can have different students participate as wish as well, and then whatever. Yeah, so what they're okay. trying, yeah, they're trying to get, um, they're trying to get as many students involved as possible to say, you know, how do we, like, how do we influence each other in a really positive way? So if the school needs anything, or you know, we want to. I don't just present in a certain way. We want to make sure, like you had said earlier, treat each other with a level of dignity and respect. Like, what does that look like? What does that mean? You know, what does that mean to a teenage student? Um, you know, they talk a lot about even teachers. Like, we watch you all the time. The way you treat each other matters, right? Because we see that, and you're our models, and that matters to us. They want to interview teachers. They want to talk about, get their perspective, and. Um, what their view on things are. And they're very willing, you know, even in the um, school council meeting, there's um, 10 students on there and saying, this is what we can do, this is how we can do our part. So they're not, you know, no one's, um, everyone's sort of taking responsibility for themselves in a really positive way of how do I make this community better? How do I work towards, you know, making this a place that people want to be? How do I leave a legacy of, um, the kind of community that we want to have. So when I step away, that this community is still functioning in a way. So they now have a 10th grader that has joined them so that, you know, he can sort of take that torch with them. But they're very, it's, it's, it's really, really great. So they're, um, they're on almost their third episode. So it's just that we have teachers that are helping them like on the side to edit it and stuff on top of their job and on top of, you know, or uh, crisscross themselves. He's amazing, but he does drama, and he does you know, he does so much, and he's taken this on as you know one more thing to, to do because he enjoys it and he's a good person, and, and so um, they're you know they're working to get that out. So he just has a few edits to make, and then we'll put it on the SCTV news. And then again, you know again, kids are taking ownership in like cybersecurity. They did an amazing job reaching out to the. 
um, Secretary of Education and inviting him here. He had a great experience here, um, and uh, so hopefully he had an opportunity to listen to that. So, so you get a lot of students taking leadership um, opportunities here. So we have hundreds of students that want to participate. When we send something out for leadership opportunities, the amount of, Rob, what did you say? You said how many of when you did, you sent yours out for to be on your team? You had what, like 30 students that showed up yeah, the day? 39 signed up, but 20, 23 showed. So. Just to be part of his group right out of the gate. So I had the same thing. I, it was really tough to pick the school council because there were so many unbelievable stories of like 40 kids. You know, Shanna had like 100 kids for a student leadership group for student ambassadors. So everyone wants to be sort of a part of, you know, putting their stamp on the community in a positive way. So, so those are the great things. And, you know, we have problems just like everyone else. And when they come, we handle them and but we don't let that bog us down those are just issues for the moment so that's it yeah, thank you Thanks for some, any questions for Christina um, I do have yeah two comments just to <coughs> take you back off of your sure. uh, presentation so um, one question is I know that we're speeding up to open house would it be possible to get a um, school committee table for any school committee members that want to come in and just kind of meet the community and then if you guys are free for that day we'll be in a location that parents teachers and everyone can find us um in the cafeteria you're coming <laughs> and then, thanks sandy for volunteering the whole I table know. the whole time <laughs> like, oh. i don't think you quite heard me right <laughs> <laughs> so that also piggybacks off of i went I went to the conference last week and I was only able to participate in a couple of things and one of the things is the school committee belonging or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So with that and kind of to piggyback off what the kids are doing, they talked about um, trusted adults and getting students with trusted adults and all of these things and how difficult it is mm -hmm. for students to find adults that they trust. So I wasn't sure if there was a way that we could kind of broadcast, um, meet our teachers and our faculty, like on a, on a screen or so, where we pick a faculty member or a teacher for, to like two or three a week to just kind of have a PowerPoint process through that just says who they are, what they do here, why they joined, like why they love Southeastern, I guess. And then maybe if they speak other languages, to list those so those uh, foreign language children can come and find them. And, use them as an asset and that really is just because like the guidance counselor doesn't always mm -hmm. get to kids and sometimes they don't want to go to the guidance counselor because it has to be escalated sometimes they just want to talk mm -hmm. to somebody else mm -hmm. so those are just two uh, questions I have so can you talk a little more about that so you want to, to have like a student that we identify or a teacher I a teacher. thought teacher. it would be nice teacher. yeah for our teachers to just kind of present themselves okay. Any teacher that's like willing to present themselves as like an asset or an additional trusted adult that somebody could come to and oh, okay. and On speak to. Teams. Yeah, yeah. Like mm -hmm. really, I was like thinking about people that like no one sees, like the library, and really like who, how many students know the library, and like okay. what she does, and like things like that, or like your school nurse or something like that, and mm -hmm. kind of why they're here, and if they speak other languages for those foreign mm -hmm. language students that can't always get to trans a translator okay. if that's like mm -hmm. available that's great and then if they speak different languages maybe yeah yeah like any fun fact they want to share comfortable sharing or whatever sure if that's a great so idea much. because yeah. you know kids you they don't mention that like i don't know where my teachers went to school oh, so if i'm thinking about a school or i'm thinking about a career and i don't know that that was their career or i don't know that they you know sometimes they switched industries and they didn't realize that that was sort of their initial career that they started off in mm -hmm. so that's great so they can sort of seek that teacher out and if there's a picture there right yeah, like, you're, you're the one that right right just, i just feel like it's going to build a little bit more trust and like visual yeah, visibility yeah. 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 And I, think, I mean I think I can speak on behalf of the faculty by saying our, our kids have good relationships with their teachers and mm -hmm. especially their vocational teachers yeah. and generally see you as trusted adults and yeah, yeah. Um, but I agree I and, and you know what I think even for myself because there's so many new people since COVID and mm -hmm. Um, that I don't know as well, and I'd love to get to know everybody a little bit better. So I think that's a great idea. 
in Canton, we have little signs outside of our door that says like, "Hi, my name is," and I speak these languages. And then it, you have to put like what book you're reading currently. Oh, really? Yeah, let's oh, do. Cool. 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 Change love. I like that. Yeah. Good but then, like the teachers who speak different languages, it says it right on our door. Mm -hmm. Not on mine. Okay. Unfortunately, I only speak one language. So. We have a surprise for you at Open House. So yeah, Jared, that's interesting. We have uh, a surprise for you at Open House. On the, the open teachers house. Made. On the open house, is there going to be Skills USA members giving tours, or is it just going to be free to roam? Nope, so I've had a couple of parents ask me. Yep, there's student ambassadors, so there will be tours. There's student okay. ambassadors, they have t-shirts on. Okay. Um, if they speak a different language, a t-shirt will be written in a different language. We'll have different language rooms um, on that day so <laughs> that you can get a lot of information about our school in your um, in your the language that you speak um, so those will be designated rooms so we'll make announcements about that um, and then again we try to make it easy to identify students that you know maybe speak a different language we used to have it on their lanyard which may still have something on there but it'll be on the back of their t-shirt as well um, so that they can um, and they'll know where those rooms are too to you know, so that parents can talk, like the frequently asked questions, and go through everything that they have in their packet. And so we'll make announcements around that. Thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on, on to our TI director's report and that. Hello. Uh, so on Saturday, November the 2nd, the TI had our health care open house, which we've been doing separately for a couple of years now. Um, and it focused on dental, medical assisting, and um, the practical nurse program. We had about 100 students and or potential students. And we have sessions on just general program information and the requirements for the program, a little bit about, about the admissions process and the testing process. and. But we have a section for financial aid, so people can ask preliminary questions about that. And we give tours of the classroom space and um, the lab spaces. And we talk to them about making a strong application, you know, how to best represent yourself and throughout the application process. So um, that was our, our first. But we've also had an evening medical assisting open house last week and then coming up next week we have um, our first trades open house for this season but we really have to stop calling it trades because it's also cosmetology and you know, culinary and, and that type of thing so um, sign ups for that are good this one we tend to get a lot of maybe juniors in high school as well as seniors so um, it does tend to be more high school based than and older people, so we had a lot of parents with it as well, which is which is always nice to see. And they very often are looking at a trade, so they, you know, tour all the programs. And um, I will say that um, Andy and John Medeiros have managed to switch people from <laughs> really invested in electrical so, uh, until they saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> this year I will not be able to attend, unfortunately, but I am going to send in a um, replacement. So we'll make it work again. So that means more electrical people, less. <laughs> more machinists, less electric electricians. Mm -hmm. well, really this year we have that. five students going into machine tool in the high mm -hmm. during the day for the TI. So that is an all time high. So we'll Beautiful. see how mm -hmm. much of that was you. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, John, <laughs> Very true. Um, we also had an advisory board meeting on the 16th of uh, October. The food was prepared by the kids, or the kids, the students in the food truck program. They did a great job. They had high school students there to help um, do the serving and stuff, but the food was really, really great. They made a pumpkin cheesecake, mm -hmm. which I thought sounded a little bit heavy, but it was delicious. <laughs> I ate it all. Um, but, you know, the advisory boards are, are so helpful, and it's also a good opportunity. You know, we have Atrius Healthcare there who take a lot of our medical assistance on clinical, but we were able to connect them with the new program director for the practical nurse program mm. because they're hiring practical nurses, and so, you know, those kinds of opportunities are, are great. It's good for our students and, and for our faculty. 
Um, but that was a great day. And then just to, I put in a few things that are going on. We have some tease tests coming up. We um, have the electricity orientation, electricity program orientation for, is on November 14th. I think it's Thursday night because we have two things on Thursday night. Um, as well as the tease test. And then um, the high school trades open house is November the 20th and another tease test on the 17th and December 19th we're having a guidance breakfast I don't know that that's the best day for it but that's the mm -hmm. fun weekend mm -hmm. so we're having a guidance breakfast and maybe the guidance counselors will all come because it'll you know be a relaxing morning for them and then not on this list but we're having a site visit by the Veterans Administration for um, veterans benefits when we have students our veterans they come in a couple years and look at the school and look at our catalog and ask questions about how we do things so that'll they'll be here a couple of hours on the 4th of december and that's all good in ti mm -hmm. all is, continues to be hopping mm -hmm. good. Good to be yeah any questions for pat mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> moving on, last but not least, um, <laughs> Rob, Rob, do we always have you last? I always feel like we try to move you up. I know. <laughs> I'll play right back to it. All right. so. <laughs> Good guess. Yes. 2A. <laughs> so a few things just um, uh, from my HR uh, side of things, uh, this past month, uh, we've hired uh, new employees in the following positions. Dual, we hired a dual enrollment coordinator, on-call uh, daily substitute teachers, three of those, uh, long-term substitute two, um, STI full-time practical nurse instructor, STI part-time uh, practical nurse instructor, two of those, and a custodian. Um, looking at some of our HR projects this, this, um, this month, uh, mandatory training, 70% of our mandatory training has been completed by employees through ArcsEd. Um, we are sending out final reminders to employees this week. Um, so, so we're put to that, you know, so we're almost there um, and our, seems like our community has participated well so, and uh, it looks like we'll meet our deadline. Um, Lunch and Learn 1 is our first Lunch and Learn series for the school year. Uh, we'll be on Wednesday, November 20th. Uh, Lunch and Learn series has been developed to provide valuable insights um, and knowledge to various HR topics. Uh, the first session, just like last year, will cover essentials um, aspects of frontline central and absence management, um, including logging in and accessing the employee uh, employees' accounts, assessing um, the and completing necessary forms, requesting time off, and managing employee absences. So um, that will be um, on November 20th, um, and it's a really good value to a lot of our employees. Our new um, hire check-ins, our first round of new hire check-ins for this year is almost complete. Um, some of the emerging trends from our data um, are pretty, uh, extremely positive. Um, um, our members are saying inclusive and in, um, that Southeastern is an inclusive and a positive uh, community experience that they are, that they are um, feeling. Um, positions are exceeding the initial expectations, so they are really excited about the positions and um, the possibilities and the collaborations that they are having. Um, employees are feeling that there's an overwhelming sense of support um, from our supervisors, administrators, and mentors, which is extremely um, positive. Um, and faculty and staff are <coughs> welcoming and, and kind and helpful and supportive as well. So um, our new employees are feeling it from all levels, um, from anywhere from the students to mentors to faculty, staff, and to the supervisors. So that is um, amazing. Um, one initiative that was um, that we started this past um, uh, last couple weeks ago, uh, the substitute walk and talk sessions. Um, this month, um, the HR department kicked off its first substitute teacher uh, group information um, session led by um, Melissa Woods. Uh, this, uh, these sessions are provide potential new substitute teachers with information about the district. Um, a school tour, um, what you know, basically looking at the day in the life of a substitute, um, getting them familiar with shops and uh, different academic areas in the school building itself. Versus a lot of times, substitutes once they sign up, they just show up one day and, and they're given a room. Um, that's usually traditional in a lot of schools. So we wanted to kind of bridge some gaps there, especially with some of our, um, with some of 
the issues that where people aren't picking up substitute um, positions in the shop side because they're a little bit afraid, not really knowing if they could substitute in those areas. So being familiar with those areas really help uh, bridge that gap and give them some familiarity. <coughs> um, and we've already got positive feedback from them, appreciating that opportunity. Um, some of them are substitutes in other districts as well. So they like to, they feel really connected with us. Um, and two of the three that were in that tour already picked up um, assignments and have picked up assignments on the academic as well as the shop side as well. Um, for athletics, i just like to recognize our um, boys and girls uh, soccer team and our um, cross-country teams for winning the Mayflower League um, championships, uh, conference championship. Um, it's a big feat. Our athletics this season has done extremely well um, as far as, you know, wins and losses. Is, you know, obviously sports is more than just the wins and losses piece, um, but we want to celebrate and recognize those students for their hard work and dedication um, to winning their conference and, and, and accomplishing that um, this past fall. Um, on the DEI side, a few things have happened over the past month. I was with, we um, meeting with our seat program, which uh, which just was mentioned. Um, this is our second go around with seat, and uh, we're seeing growth. As um, last year, we had two students sign up for seat. And this year we've had 39 students sign up for seat. So it's a major, major, major improvement um, from that and as well as our faculty and staff members. So uh, whereas last year we were operating somewhere around 14 people um, in total, whereas this year we're going to be in the 50s. So it's a good problem to have um, where we try to figure out what that's going to look like and really merge into two groups so that way we have the student feedback, the faculty and staff feedback, all different positions and positionalities within the school, but also looking at how we can collaborate um, as, as one um, to do things and to make decisions and to, um, to really, you know, look at a, the total student experience and how we can help improve that here at Southeastern. Um, other than that, that's pretty much where we are right now. Um, some of the stuff that we went over with the SRA as well as the principal search. Um, oh, and outstanding community member um, awards for this month. This um, tomorrow we'll be announcing four new outstanding community members. Um, this is total eight this this year, um, and that has gone extremely positive. We had a lunch um, with uh, Superintendent McClannan, um, with Principal Guarini, um, and others that were there, um, and that was just great feedback. And again, it's creating a good positive vibe throughout our entire um, district. So that's it. Thank you. Any questions for Rob? Okay, thank you. So at this time, I move to go into executive session according to Chapter 30A, Section 21, Paragraph A3, which is necessary to discuss strategy in respect to negotiations and litigation because an open meeting would have a detrimental effect on the bargaining position of the public body and to not reconvene an open session to adjourn the meeting. Um, it will just be voting school committee members only, and we will take a three-minute break to aid with the transition, but we do need a vote before that happens. Mm -hmm. Roll call vote. Tony? Yes. Christine? Yes. Kelsey? Yes. Andrew? Yes. Barbara? Yes. Jerson? Yes. Jen? Yes. Robin? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll see everybody in three minutes. So only school committee members? Just school, voting school committee members. <laughs>